Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Periodic Conversations. Today, I have Michaela Lynn with me, and we are going to be discussing CVID, which is a common variable immunodeficiency, and anxiety and depression. So welcome, Michaela. Thank you for being here today. Hi, thank you for having me. So Michaela is 23 years old, loves to dabble in many different hobbies, loves anything about the sky and the world, and enjoys spending time with her boyfriend, friends, and family. Uh, she has a primary immunodeficiency called CVID, which is common variable immunodeficiency that has been caused or that has caused some secondary health issues, as well as maintaining her anxiety and depression for many years. So I'm looking forward to discussing with you more about CVID as I'm, I don't know much about it. And I'm sure that the listeners don't either. And then also uh, anxiety, depression, your tips and tricks that have helped you for combating those. And then also the things that you feel like it didn't work. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess we'll start with my common variable immunodeficiency. Um, it's a immunoglobin deficiency, which is essentially our antibodies that help us fight any sort of sickness. So my whole life, I just kept getting back to back infections. I never really understood why I was always sick. Um, because of that, I was constantly on antibiotics and I just never felt good because antibiotics are definitely not good for your body mm -hmm. and after years of just kind of trying to troubleshoot that they did an immunodeficiency panel and realized that my body was lacking a lot of the good things that we need um, so now I am on a plasma treatment and it's weekly so many donors mm -hmm. give plasma which is derived from blood and that has been helping me a lot which is really nice um, and I also got invited to the Primary Immunodeficiency Foundation Conference of the Year in Chicago for a scholarship. So I'll be able to meet a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, so that kind of caused a lot of uh, secondary issues. I now have sinus problems, asthma, skin issues, eye problems. Um, I got a lot of allergies, so I closed my cleaning business. I had to rehome one of my cats because he was just ridden with dander. Um, I can't touch any dogs anymore, which is super upsetting. <laughs> um, but I do really love all animals. And um, that's probably been the hardest thing for me, actually, is the animals. Of mm -hmm. course, the treatment is really hard as well. Um, a weekly treatment in your life is something really hard to adjust to mentally, but also physically. Like my legs are very swollen at the end of my treatment, which makes it pretty hard to know get out walking or really do much because I'm pretty groggy from it and the fatigue I would say is probably the hardest symptom to manage yeah, yeah. and uh, that's also caused a lot of depression and anxiety so I do see a therapist which personally I think is like one of the best things for me um, and it's really helped me manage like how I'm going to work through my initial problems but also like long-term goals of how I'm going to achieve things and just being able to like sit down with somebody and discuss what kind of goals I want to shoot for in my life now and in the long term. And she's just really helped me manage her treatment wise, how I'm going to mentally battle getting through the treatment. So like little baggies actually is one of the coolest things that I've done for myself with all of my medical supplies in it. So I don't just sit on the ground and like stare at everything. I feel like that was one of my biggest problems as I sat there and I was like, I don't really want to grab the needles. I don't really want to grab the plasma. And if I just have everything like in a group all together, I'm like, okay, I can tackle this. Like we can do this. And then it's really just like sitting through it for a few hours. Then I'm good. So you have like a, a bag that you bring with you to a clinic? So I actually do it myself at home. So oh, wow. okay. it's, uh, yeah, it's a uh, three needles. You can do, I guess up to four needles is the set. I do three because stabbing yourself four times is just not appealing. Um, but two times also made a really big welt. So I found that three was kind of the happy medium between not stabbing myself four times and not having huge welts. So I actually just do it at home. I set out all my medical supplies. Um, I inject the needles and the plasma for a few hours and I set it all up in a pump and everything. I've kind of got a little bag I can carry it into so I can walk around my house. And I feel like the walking also helps disperse it a little so those welts don't get as big. Mm -hmm. And it did take a lot of trial and error to get to a point where I didn't feel really sick. Um, I did learn through some like Facebook support groups, which I think are very helpful. 
that you can get aseptic meningitis from infusing the plasma too fast because it's a protein overload on your body. Mm -hmm. Um, So because of that, I was getting really sick and I like couldn't stand, I couldn't talk. I was like pretty much just felt like I was stuck in my own body and I just laid down in a dark room for hours. I've now troubleshooted all the way to like walking around during my treatment and feeling, I guess, the best you can feel after doing the treatment, which is really nice. Does it feel draining after you inject the plasma? Yeah, it does. But there was one time out of all the times where like the next day I was like up dancing and I was like, I feel so much energy. Um, Unfortunately, I haven't had that every other time, but at least I'm at the point where I feel okay. Um, I do it probably my first day off or the night after work that I have before my two days off. Mm -hmm. Um, So that is something my work has had to adjust to is I I have to have two days off because having only one day off doing the treatment and going back to work was not working for me. I couldn't lift things and stuff. Yeah. Um, So yeah, I uh, do it at the beginning of my days off. I take my full two days to kind of rest and do the stuff I need to do or see anyone I want to see. And then I head back to work. Okay. So how long has it been since you've been diagnosed? Um, so it's uh, been just about a year. I've been on treatment, I think, for about seven or eight months now. Yeah, wow, but it took yeah. five years for them to figure it out. So for that five years, I was really just on antibiotics every month. Wow. Yeah, and antibiotics are incredibly hard on your stomach. On yeah, your stomach so lining. I have a lot of stomach problems now. No. Um, yeah, working through that is pretty difficult, but the online community, I think, is like a really important thing to um, like divulge in if you feel like you're not able to figure things out on your own. I found a lot mm-hmm. of like gut health recipes and just like things that can help your gut health by following more like influencers or going on Pinterest. And um, that's really, yeah, that's helped a lot. I feel like, you know, eating clean food is one of the most important things for your body. I definitely notice a big difference when I'm not eating good. I feel just so bad like everything feels awful Mm -hmm. yeah I can imagine especially with having such weak stomach lining like I mean like personally for myself I don't have any amino deficiencies and I definitely I'll eat some candies and a bag of chips and I'm I'm sitting there like why did I just do that (laughs) why right (laughs) so I I can doesn't have any health issues and he's like that he's like I can't eat no crappy food and feel okay yeah well, I think it's just a good thing to stick away from, but I, um, it's, it's nice that at least, you know, your body and you know, what works for you now. And it, it seems like you have a good routine with it as well. Yeah. I think it took a long time to get to the point of, uh, you know, figuring out what the triggers were. I tried a lot of different diets like dairy free and gluten free and all of these different things. And I really think um, moderation is probably the best route is figuring out what the triggers are yes but also just moderation of those triggers so not eating you know too much of anything i think Mm -hmm. even if you're eating really clean food you can eat too much of a clean food and it can still make you feel pretty crappy like you're not going to sit down and eat a whole bag of apples and just feel great (laughs) this is true yeah moderation is key that's for sure Yeah, yeah and i also um have been reading some books on like the microbiomes of your gut And I feel like that's a really important thing to educate yourself on because our gut is really like a second brain to our body, which a lot of people don't realize. Mm -hmm. And if you're not taking care of your gut, your gut can't take care of you. So as much as I might have an immunodeficiency, I think a lot of it also relies on the amount of stress that I'm enduring and if I'm taking care of my microbiomes. Mm. So how do you feel like that you, you deal with your stress from day to day? therapist is really good Mm -hmm. so I feel like that's a my main dealing with my stress um but also just putting up like the correct boundaries if I feel like something isn't working for me putting up a boundary to protect myself is really good for many years I kind of just like let everyone you know say and do what they wanted and didn't really care Mm -hmm. about how I felt about things Um, I let people just use me and take a lot from me and I'm at the point now that I'm like if you don't want to text me I'm not going to text you. And I think that's really important. Those kind of boundaries of, you know, this isn't feeling good for me. This is giving me a migraine or making my gut feel bad. I'm not going to do this to myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, it's a very good thing to, to come to. 
and understand that you need to protect your energy and your space especially with the people that are so close to you, you know, we'll, we'll let people walk all over us because we care about them. But then it comes to a certain point where we need to put up that boundary. And I really respect that. And and good for you for being able to hold that tight. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it was really hard. I mean, I felt like it was a lot of people in my family. Um, and then a lot of the friends I, I came across too, you know, I, I was the kind of person that would show up on your doorstep and bring you a little basket of stuff. Every time you didn't feel good, I'd be there every time someone was crying. But I think the biggest wake up call for me was when I was diagnosed, like I was really alone. Like I only had my stepmom, my mom, uh, my boyfriend, and you know, a handful of other more distant people that were still there, but of course still care and appreciate all their support. But it was, it was a really small group of people and it wasn't the people that I was necessarily giving all of my energy to Mm -hmm. and when I was sitting there you know doing treatment for the first few times I was like crying or not feeling good about it or you know getting anxiety about the fact I had to stab myself I'm actually really good with needles but surprisingly stabbing yourself with needles Mm -hmm. is very different than some educated person doing it for you and that was the wake-up call where I was like okay you're not sitting here helping me you're not you know, bringing me a coffee to make me feel better or calling me to see how my treatment went. So I'm going to take care of me. I'm going to care about how my treatments go. And that's Mm going to be what's best for me. Yeah. Well, and you definitely notice those type of people or you notice when you're going through a hard time, who is there for you and who isn't there for you. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's really good for you that you came to a certain conclusion and you realized what your worth is. And, and with that being said, that can help, I mean, with, with anxiety and depression is just being able to put up those boundaries and having that knowing, knowing your worth and knowing what, what you deserve to be treated as. Yeah. And I also think like making um, a different group of friends really helped too, not just Mm -hmm. having one person that you like solely rely on. I feel like I was doing that for a long time and now I'm realizing that like having these different kinds of friends is really healthy for me. Like I have a friend who works out of town and every time she comes home, she lives in the building I do. And she just like brings me over a little bowl of soup if she's making soup where I'll be like, hey, I'm making this like new tofu meal. Do you want to try it? And we're both like trying to eat less meat or do something. And that's really nice. But then I also have these friends where I'm like, hey, do you just want to go to yoga? Um, So like not just friends where it's like, I'm doing everything with just you. I'm going grocery shopping with you. I'm having game nights with just you. I'm calling only you. And now it's all these different types of friends. And I feel like that's Mm -hmm. a lot healthier for me because I'm not just relying on one sole person essentially to like help make me happy, help support me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, because the sole person that that needs to help you be happy is yourself, right? Right. (laughs) So being able to take care of your environment like you are, and take control of it and understand that you do need that variety in your life. Because realistically speaking, one person can't just be there for you all the time, right? Right. Because they have to be there for themselves. But being able to have a variety of friends and being able to, like everybody needs their alone time and everybody needs their their friendship time or their family time. So it is hard to get that just for just from one singular person. It's a little bit different if you're, it's your partner because they have more invested into your into your relationships. So yeah. I think that that's, that's really awesome that you've been able to find such a great group of friends, which I know that for myself personally, being able to have built it or built the relationships that I have built um, with quite a few different friends now um, has changed my life around rather than maybe about a year, two years ago when I just had just a couple of friends and then they ended up moving away. And that was really hard because, you know, you see someone every single day and they're your support network and then they move away and you're just like, oh my gosh, like, what do I what do I do now? Right. You kind of feel alone. So slowly but surely building that back up and then finding people that are, say your, your yeah, like you said, your yoga friends or your gym buddies or, or your lunch date girlfriends, um, or just the ones that you just sit and you watch movies with, you know, there's, there's a beauty to all of it. But also I do want to make a note too, that if you aren't surrounded by a lot of good friends, or if you don't have a big, big group of friends, just having a couple of really close friends is really important as well and taking your time with them and and just making sure that you are being treated appropriately and putting up boundaries when you're not uh that can that can really help with uh keeping your your mental in a good place 
I agree. Yeah, I definitely don't think you need to like have like a, a big group of friends. Like my little circle maybe is just a handful of people, but they can offer, you know, different kind of supports and activities. I can do things with them. And I have a really great partner who's very supportive of everything I do, very supportive of the treatment. If I didn't have that, maybe I would be looking for like some more, um, you know, solid individual relationships. But because mm -hmm. I do have that in a partner, I feel like now I'm looking for a different kind of group of friends because a lot of the time in the past, I had very close friends that, you know, I thought we were like so solid. We literally did everything together and how fast that disappeared when it wasn't what they wanted anymore made me realize that like, it's not what I want anymore. I want to take care of myself now. I don't want other people to just solely make me happy. I want them to experience things with me. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, when I say like, I'm a huge lover of everything of the sky, I love just watching the sunset. I love just doing really simple things. And mm -hmm. sometimes maybe my partner doesn't want to go and watch the sunset. Like that doesn't need to be his thing, but I can go for a walk by myself and do that. And I think it's important to find some inner happiness with yourself where you're just content doing some things on your own as well. Yeah. I agree with you completely. Finding those hobbies that are personal hobbies. Yeah. And yeah. I love reading. Reading is really important. It's good for you. Educates you a lot. So that helps me um, in ways that I like read psychology books and I read, you know, books to understand how other people could be thinking. I think it's really good to sympathize and understand about how other people could be perceiving things. Um, for example, in work situations, if you have this person where you're like, wow, I really don't understand how their work ethic is and their this is or that or whatever, maybe understand like why it's like that. Do they have some troubles, you know, before you came? How did their work situation look? I think it's good to understand how other people could be perceiving the situation. Not everybody is built the same. We all have very different minds. Not everyone is going to think so straightforward. Um, some people have their own issues, their own mental health battles that they're fighting. And I think it's mm -hmm. important to recognize you know, you don't need to pinpoint it and be like, they have this, but recognizing they might, they might be struggling with something. I feel like everybody is struggling with something and it doesn't matter the degree of that, as long as you're respecting their personal space and boundaries and how they're dealing with things too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a key point is respecting people's space. I mean, mentioned a couple of times in here, which is boundaries and also giving people the uh, time to be able to come to you if they need to come to you with something so say if they are going through something rather than you know are you okay are you okay just giving them their space yeah and I think sometimes space also allows people to understand what they're wanting you know I've definitely given people space and that space was that space was taken they never came back and mm -hmm. that's okay too and I think recognizing that if you're always there for someone you're never, you know, kind of leaving them alone always. Are you okay? Do you want me to come over? Can I be there for you? Always calling them, checking in. And then you do give them some space, whether they ask for it or you just give it and they don't come back. Maybe that's okay too. Yeah, I agree with that. Another thing though, if somebody was going through extreme anxiety and depression, I would probably reach out to maybe their, their family and just to make sure that they are okay. Cause you just, yeah. you never know, you never know to what degree somebody is going through something with, but, but I agree with you that if somebody doesn't give you the same energy that you're giving them to, I mean, reciprocate the energy that they are giving you, which would be taking a step back if, if that's what yeah. we're talking about here. So, so yeah, I understand that completely. But it is important to recognize what kind of friends and uh, family and support people have. If they don't have any, and you are one of their core people, do you think it is really important you know, to reach out to anybody else that you think might be a support for them if you are worried about them. Mm -hmm. There is an array of different supports out there that you can take people to or offer to take them to. And I think that that's really important. There are some people suffering with some very serious depression, anxiety, or any other mental health battles that they may, they may need you to, you know, be that person to help them get some help if they're willing. Mm hmm yeah, most, most definitely. And I don't know, it's the same thing that if, if you were going through something and you needed somebody yet you didn't want them to reach out to you, or you didn't want anybody near you, eventually you are going to need that. You are going to need to open up in some sort of manner. It's just whether or not, I guess if it was 
you or I, you know, it's, it's difficult to say if you're willing to let somebody in, but at some right. point it's like, if that's the last option that you have, um, it's, I mean, it's hard to get people to open up and it's hard to walk over to somebody and be like, can I help you? What, what do you need? And if they're not willing to open up, I mean, that's their own personal choice. But at the end of the day, Definitely. at least we have um, hotlines and different sorts of things that we can uh, use in case somebody is going through something and, and you know, never stray away from doing a, a personal checkup with the police as well. If there's something that actually is concerning and you're yeah. too, you're not too sure what's going on with the person. Yeah, I think uh, wellness checks are, you know, very important. Are. And yeah, and especially, you know, some people with addiction issues or anything like that too, wellness checks can be you know, very vital in the sense of mental health or addiction. Um, Some people only have a span of hours before something could be seriously affecting them to a level that you can't, you can't do anything about. Um, But I also think it's really important that, you know, if people make like alarming comments or anything that you just ask, like, are you okay? Do you want to talk? Because Mm -hmm. I've heard some people make a joke to me or something, you know, and I'm like, hey, that was kind of an alarming joke. Like that didn't sound funny. And sometimes I'll just be like, are you okay? Like, do you want to talk about that? And if they don't, like, that's okay too. But I might circle back and check around later. Hey, you know, earlier that joke, like, do you want to talk about it? I know you didn't want to talk about it then, but are you okay? And they might say yes, they might say no. But, you know, whether that's a stranger, a friend, a coworker, it is important to just be like, you know, maybe you aren't okay. Yeah. And there's, there's nothing wrong with not being okay either. We, we all go through exactly. anxiety and depression and it's just being able to let ourselves open up, even if maybe we don't want to open up. Yeah. I definitely have reached out to my family a, a lot over the past few months. And I'm like, Hey, I'm not okay today, you know, and, mm-hmm. and that's okay. And they have taken that very well and they help, you know, as needed, but sometimes, you know, it rolls around to that day off I have and, Maybe I just want to read a book. Maybe I just want to go for a walk or, and I just feel like I can't because I'm sleeping all morning. I have to sleep an outrageous amount for a human. Um, And then I wake up and I'm, you know, I've got a headache and I don't feel good. And I've got to sit down and do my treatment for the next three hours. And it's just like, maybe Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do that today. Maybe I wanted to just enjoy the sun outside, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think just, sitting there and recognizing, okay, maybe I might not feel okay, but how can I feel okay? Like today I slept, you know, a really good portion of the day, had a really bad headache. Um, but I went out and I filled up my car. I was like, it's so beautiful outside, like the sun shining and just appreciating mm-hmm. like some of the small things. I'm like looking around, there's lots of people like biking and doing all these things. And I'm like, the world is beautiful. And I just sit there and recognize that sometimes for myself, which I feel like helps myself a lot. Um, I'm a very grateful person to just be alive. And sometimes I take that in and I'm just like, I'm having a bad day and that's okay. But maybe I'll go sit outside and soak up some of that sun, even on my balcony for 10 minutes and just, you know, make myself feel a little bit better, read a a chapter of my book or do something that makes me feel good. Yeah. Well, and, and that's just it is finding the things that make you feel good, even if it's just for a moment, something that just makes you smile. Even if it's just a specific YouTuber that you'd like to watch or something on Netflix, that's something that's easy enough to be able to just throw on, especially if you aren't feeling well, you can just sit on your couch or sit in front of your laptop and make that happen. Yeah, I think little communities are really good. Like my boyfriend is an introvert and such a homebody and and he loves like just little YouTube groups and stuff like that. And, Mm -hmm. you know, everyone has their thing. Like I really enjoy the Facebook support groups that I have found. Um, there's many like called zebra groups. Um, So in in medical school, you're taught to essentially not pick out the primary immunodeficiencies and all of these like more intricate things. You're just straightforward. Okay. They probably have like bronchitis, like all these like mainstream things. So they call people who have, you know, more complex issues, zebras, Um, And that can be a lot of different issues. So a lot of these groups are called zebras or seabed groups or whichever they call it. And I found some supports that even live in Edmonton, which has been really nice. Like a a girl I met lives in Beaumont and talking back and forth with her has just given me so much support. And I know it's given her some support. We were able to troubleshoot 
in the beginning of her treatments, um, how she was feeling just like I wasn't feeling good. And she's finally at a, at a point of like giving herself treatment where she doesn't feel awful. So sometimes finding those little tight knit communities are really good for you because there's a niche in everything in hobbies, in illness and everything. And just connecting with people that are kind of going through the same thing sometimes can be really comforting. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Is there yeah. anything else that you would like to add before we close off today? I don't think so. I think we, we covered it all pretty good. We did. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing today. I really appreciate it. And um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. And any of the periodic listeners, I hope you also are enjoying your morning, afternoon, evening, whatever, wherever you're at. And uh, take care, everyone. Thank you.